الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. All praise due to Allah and my praise be upon His Messenger Muhammad صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم. Before I start, I'll just uh, make a one note which I have seen that some of the brothers when they pray, bearing in mind it's maybe first time for me to join the Aisha prayer. Usually I come a bit late. I have noticed that uh, some of the brothers when they pray. They put the right on the left after saying Sami Allahu liman hamida. That means when the Imam says Sami Allahu liman hamida, some brothers they put the right on the left following a fatwa or maybe a dalil or a proof which they know of. Well, first of all, I'm not going to discuss the proof here. That is the proof of Wa'il ibn Hujr. Uh, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, whenever he stands up, he puts his right and the left. And uh, if you want to uh, to see how many scholars on this side who say he's known, you don't have to put it, and the other side says you have to put it. it you, well, if you play this this way, tennis match, we will win. We will say that the ones who really don't put their hands after the ruku, there are more than the ones that put their hands after the ruku, but it doesn't work like this. It is not much. The thing is that when you are behind an imam, that Imam, he does not put the right on the left after the Ruku'ah. And we know that that Imam is not a Muqallid. He's an Imam which we trust, alhamdulillah. Then it is better for the person to really follow the Imam instead of making another difference, divergence amongst the brothers. And that is why Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, when he prayed behind Uthman ibn Abi Affan, radiyallahu, on both of them, may Allah be pleased with both of them, when he prayed behind him in Mina, and uh, Mina, when you are in the state of Ihram, you pray Dhuhr and the Asr 2 2. But Uthman completed the prayer and he prayed 4. Allah ibn Mas'ud as well prayed 4. But after he finished the prayer, he said, Verily, I prayed behind the Messenger, وسلم, and I prayed behind Abu Bakr and Umar, and all of them they prayed 2. And I wish that my 4 were 2. But. Because of this, it's going to cause more diverge or more of splitting the brotherhood. That is why al-khilafu kulluhu shar. The difference is all of it, or divergence among the brothers, is all of it to be from the evil. And that is why he followed the imam in spite of that that imam was making a clear mistake. Now, the imam, when he puts the right on the left, on the rukur, uh, after the rukur, then we will tell those who do not put their hand, if they feel that Imam is not a muqallid, that everybody who should as well put the right on the left. And that is why. Shaykh al Albani, Shaykh ibn Baz, may, have, may Allah have mercy on both of them. Shaykh al Albani said in his book, Sifat Salat al Nabi, it is a bid'ah for a person to put the right on the left after the record. But at the same time, when he used to pray behind Shaykh ibn Baz, when he used to teach at the University of Al Madina, he would put his right on the left behind Sheikh Ibn Baz. In spite of saying that it is a bid'ah, but he would put the right on the left to follow the Imam. Why? Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Verily, I am your Imam. Follow me. If I make ruku, I make ruku. If I make takbir, I make takbir. Then he said, Do not differ, be different on me. La takhtalifu ali. Don't be different from me. Once he prayed sitting down, and he saw the companions praying, standing up. So he told him to sit down. And the Messenger of Allah, because of his sickness and his illness, he couldn't stand up. When he looked behind, he saw the companions standing up. He told him to sit down. And then he said to follow the Imam. So the Shaykh al-Albani, he followed the Imam. In that sense, I would tell those brothers, please, if you're praying in a mosque, which we know that all of them, they don't put the right on the left after the ruku'ah, do not cause of another difference of opinion among the brothers by putting the right on the left and being different from the rest of them. The people here put the left and the right just like you put them on the thigh before you start the prayer and be like the Imam Wallahu Ta'ala Ala. Okay, start the class. Today's class is how to purify the clothes and what else? And the body. Clothes and the body. Right. Well, that's the brother to read. Okay, sir. 
For those who do not have those sheets, put your finger up, please. That's number five and number six. Okay, it's five and six. Five and six. You have one, two, and three, four, yeah? Okay, for those people who want you to join a class as well, as in continuously. We don't want flying customs here. We want permanent customs. Right. Yes. Purifying the body and clothes. If the clothes or body are contaminated with impurities, it is obligatory to wash them with water until they are cleansed of the impurities. This is especially the case if the impurity is visible, such as blood. If there are some stains that remain after washing, which would be extremely difficult to remove, they can be overlooked. If the impurity is not visible, such as urine, it is sufficient to wash it one time. Asma bint Abu Bakr related that a woman came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, Our clothes are contaminated with menstrual blood. What should we do about this? He said, Scrape it, rub it with water, pour water over it, and then pray in it. This is related by Bukhari and Muslim. If the impurities get on the lower portion of a woman's dress... Just stop. Yeah, Bukhari and Muslim. We always will stop. After the hadith, stop. After the Bukhari is 227, and Muslim... 291. Right. It's presumably here the author saying that if the impurity has something that you could see it, then you have to remove it and to wash it. And if it's not seen like the urine, then it's enough to wash it once. So at the beginning, what did he say? If the clothes or body are contaminated with impurities, it is obligatory to wash them with water until they are cleaned. Nothing left there. And then he gave you the hadith of the blood, which is the menses blood. And we know that the menses blood, we have a consensus among the scholars, it is what? Impure. Actually, the menses blood itself has extra, you could say, extra work in purifying it. Why? The Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he stated here that you should rub it, scrub it, use detergent, and after that you use water. And then in another hadith as well, you throw water in the rest of the clothes, in the rest of the garment. For example, if it's on the underwear, so you scrub it, and then you rub it with a detergent, wash it with water, and after that, you throw water in the whole of the underwear. Now, this is not the case if a piece of excrement, for example, was on the clothes, for example, in the underwear. What do you do with a piece of excrement there? What do you do? You just remove the excrement there from the clothes and then you wash it. You don't have to use what? Detergent, as long as the water takes it off. So here this hadith is talking about something which is needs more purification. And that is why in your sheets, which I presume that everybody's got it in front of him, if you go to page number six, and that is number four there at the top, says menses or post-childbirth blood. Can you see it? That's number five. Menses, or post-childbirth blood, we use water, detergent, any detergent, like you know, soap, and rubbing, scrubbing, and sprinkle water in the whole underwear, that is the gum. After this, if there is any trace of that blood, still there, no problem. You used everything, but still the blood is there, no problem. As for a piece of your excrement or any other in filth has been on your clothes, it's enough just to take the 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 the, uh, the sample itself, to take it out, and to use water. You don't have to use your it and just use water unless it's gone. But this one you have to use detergent, so it's something extra has been here said by the Messenger regarding the menstrual blood. 
Then it's the urine. The urine, of course, you don't have to remove. There's no some sort of a lump there. You could see it. You just use water. Wallahu ta'ala. Now, if excrement or any impurity touch the tail of the garment of the woman, there's another way of uh, uh, cleaning it, which the brothers are going to read now. If impurity is on the lower portion of a woman's dress, of, of a woman's dress, it is purified by dust as, as she trails along. A woman said to Umm Salama, I have a long dress that drags on the ground. Even when I walk through places that contain filth, what should I do about it? Umm Salama answered her, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, what comes after it purifies it. This is related by Ahmed and Abu Dawood. Okay, that's Ahmed. I'll give you the number of Abu Dawood, sorry. 383. Abu Dawood is 383. Can I just ask us some, just ask one question here? According to your principles here, which I presume I've everybody read them at home, okay, can she, the woman, clean her tail, the tail of her garment, with water? Can she use water to clean whatever filth is there? Or does she have to do the same thing here, just to go on top of something which is clean and that will clean the dirty area and remove the solid, whatever? Or can she use water? Anybody? To, uh, yes? Depending on which principle there. <laughs> you could use water. The principle says here, that is, if you number them, one, two, three, four. If you put that, those are just four principles there. Just number them, one, two, three, four. Number three. If the element referred to in the text for purification is not water, then it is permissible to use water. So here, for purifying the tail, there's no water, as been mentioned. But all the time, water is sufficient. Like, for example, I'm giving an example, rubbing, rubbing the shoes against the ground, or wiping a knife. You could use water. Wiping the knife will clean it, but if you don't want to wipe it, just go and put it in the, the water as well, and it will clean it. Always the water is the, you could say, the, the, the foundation of cleaning and purific purification of everything. Now, right. Any questions up to now? Okay, we'll just go to, before we go to the next title, the question, just hang on a second. If you look at page number five, number three there says, tail of a woman's dress, how do you purify it? Trailing along as what comes after it, imp after impurity, purifies it. As what comes after it, after impurity, it will purify it. Yes, question. Okay, here is the brother saying, what about the washing machine? Is it sufficient to put the underwear of one of the women that she's got the menses blood? Is it enough to do that? If the washing machine, that would really, which is the truth, that you would scrub and rub and use the detergent and everything, alhamdulillah, I think, I think the washing machine is doing more than the hands at the moment and getting so clean, so it's enough. Now, we're not talking about here, uh, everybody's got a washing machine. Some people are having a washing machine. But imagine that you are in somewhere that you don't have a washing machine. What do you do? Okay, so we can't really just say in everything here, oh, skip the fuck of this, washing machine is enough. We can't say that. Okay. Yes. Number four, you mentioned sprinkling water on the whole garment to see when it fits in it. Is that only washing the whole garment? Sprinkling. It's not washing the whole garment because you can't wash the whole garment and you put it on at the same time. It's exactly the same. When, for example, after you make a stinger, it is what recommended. It is not, here's a compulsory. It's recommended to what? Put water there to remove any shaitan playing around here saying, maybe this is urine or not. You just sprinkle water there. Okay? Excellent. Right. Any questions? Next topic, please. Purifying the ground. If there are impurities on the ground, it is purified by pouring water over it. This is proven by Abu Huraira's hadith mentioned earlier about the Bedouin who urinated in the, in the, mos in the mosque. The Prophet ﷺ said all that needed to be done for purification was to pour water over it. Said Abu Qulaba, the drying of the ground is its purification. Aisha said the purification of the ground is, is its becoming dry. And this is related by Ibn Abi Shayba. Right, the first hadith of the 
Bedouin man who came to the mosque, if you remember, when he urinated there, and the companion wanted to hit him, and then the messenger saw him and told him, leave him until he finishes. And then after he finished, they said to him, or he said to them, be easy. You have never been sent to be harsh to the people. Be easy on the people. Let him, and then when he's finished, you have, you could just uh, put water on the, on that urine. Now there's another narration here in this hadith. Before I go to that narration, the, the, the hadith is in Bukhari 220. Bukhari 220. Another narration, which is sahih as well, that the Messenger of Allah asked, for that sand which is being polluted by the urine to be removed. So that, for example, is radiating on the sand, that soil, the wet one, to be removed and then to put water in that place. So this is another thing to be added here. So if you want to clean urine on the floor where you want to pray, you need, you need to take the sand away and then you put water as well. And of course this is when it is wet, najasa, wet impurity. If it is solid, then you have to remove the solid thing and then put water as well. Wallahu ta'ala alam. As for the other hadith of Abu Kulaba, which is the Athar Athar, it's in Abi, Ibn Abi Shayba, in the Musannaf, it's 1 over, 50, over 57. 1 over or slash 57. Right. Can you just continue the finishing that little last one? This, of course, refers to the case where the impurity is a liquid. If the impurity is a solid, the ground will only become pure by its removal or decay. Right. Can you just go to page number five in your notes? Purifying impurities here. Number one, excrement. Relieving oneself, stinger. How do you do that? Use water or three stones or any other element to wipe except bones or stew because they are jinn's food and they do not purify as the Messenger Wasallam has clarified. Here, can you use water and three stones and you know other things to clean? Yes, as long as you don't think this is a sunnah to use water followed by stones, but to have it clean, not for the sake of worshiping, no problem to use that. But you think that the verse of Allah, when Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said, "In Allah you hibbu tawabin wa hibbu mutahirin," that uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala you hibbu that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala was talking about the people of Qiba because they used to follow the Stones with water, this is unauthentic. It is only they use, they use water. They didn't use the stones and then followed by water. So we say here, if you want to clean more, no problem, but not as it, it is a sunnah. All right? Using the three stones, we will see, inshallah, later on about etiquette to go to the bathroom. That three stones is the minimum. If you use the three stones, it is the minimum. After that, it's up to you using five or seven or so on and so forth. Then it says, cleaning the shoe, how to clean the shoe from the excrement, rubbing against the ground or the sand, which we will see, inshallah, later on, as in the book. Number two, urine. Relieving oneself, stinger, how do you do that? Same thing as above, using three stones, but here it says, no coughing, jumping, milking, etc. I'm just reminding those people who spend a long time in the toilet, they're trying to really squeeze things out which they don't really need to be squeezed, and that's why they stay a long time. Some people, they jump, you know, bring something out. Some people, they cough, and they, you know, and I, it is true, it's actually, it's not a joke. People, they really sort of jump and make a, a noise or uh, clear the throat, you know, push something out. Where Sheikh al-Islam Taymiyyah said that the private part is like a breast. The more you milk it, it will milk out. So we have to stop. So if you can't stay half an hour then the toilet trying to really, you know, bring things out. If it stops, leave it. So you don't have to really hit it like this or, you know, injure yourself. This is not from the etiquette of purification of the, of the private parts. Uh, unwean male baby here says, comparatively less impurity, I said, sprinkle water. Okay, sprinkle the water. Uh, of course, and it is male. If it is female, it's the same thing as the adult. Remember when we talked about this before. On the ground, if the urine is in the ground, take the wet sand away and pour water on it, which is best, or just pour water on it because the hadith says so here. This is to speed up purification as if it is left to dry, it will be pure eventually according to a hadith of Ibn Umar, which we'll see inshallah later on. Here, that if the land, if the earth, is dry, the urine is 
gone now. It's been evaporated, so there is no impurity. So, but to speed up the purification, what do you do? Either you take the sand and put water, or what do you do? You put the water, but it takes time to dry up, isn't it? It takes time to dry up as well. Number three, tail of a woman's dress trailing along as what comes after. Impurity purifies it. We read number four. You go to number five. Dog licking a container. You wash seven times. One wash has to be with sand, while the rest must be with water. I left you the proofs for yourself to fill it out there. Because I can't really do everything for you, as I said. I do emphasize this every, every time I come here. I had to leave something for you to go to the book and you know get the hadith and put as a proof for that point. Skin of a dead animal, not slaughtered according to Islamic sharia. What do you do to purify it? You tan it. That is dibaga, it's called salt and water and exposing it to sun. So any, any, any skin, whether it is a dead animal skin or any skin of the pig or the dog, except for the skin which is from the sheep. If you slaughter the sheep properly, then the skin is pure. But because the stinky smell of it, what do you do? You tan it. But you don't tan it because it's, in, it's impure. All right? As for the dead animals, the skin of it is impure. How do you purify it? By tanning it. Wallahu ta'ala alam. Number seven, wadi and madi. From private parts, that is use water only to wash the private part on the testicles. From the breast, sprinkle water on the area. By the way, wadi does not need to wash your testicles. It is only the madi. You remember the difference between madi and wadi? So please here emphasize that the wadi, the washing of the testicles is only involved in the madi. Because I've just been returning to the hadith there. It is only referred to what? The madi, not the wadi. The wadi is only what? Is the private part. Wallahu ta'ala ala. Mouth falling into a pot of clarified butter. What do you do? No difference between solid or liquid. Same thing. Dead mouse should be removed. And what is around it? Uh, un- should be, what is the mouse itself? And what is around it? Until there is no trace of impurity. Uh, otherwise, if the, ch- the, the, the odor or the taste or the color has been changed, then you throw the whole thing away. Number nine, impurity falling into water, large quantity of water, if it's not affected, impurity should be removed if possible. If affected, impurity should be removed if possible until water goes pure, otherwise you leave it. Small quantity of water, if characteristics change, impurity should be removed if possible, and more clean water should be added to retrieve the characteristics of the of water. Number ten, washing line, the washing line, how do you purify it? Of course, if, you, if it is made of rope or, you know, like a piece of cloth or nylon or something like this, and it's really difficult to clean, then we would say, if it's dry, if it gets dry, it will be clean by itself. Alhamdulillah, in this country, it doesn't stop raining, so just, there's no washing lines anymore. So, uh, uh, if it's uh, a, a piece of wire, metal wire, then what do you do? You just wipe it. And I'm talking about if you hang, for example, dirty clothes with the urine or so on and so forth, the children clothes or some, something like this, you just wipe the washing line. Okay, change of purity, smoke of an impurity being burnt, change of wine to grape juice. For example, I'm saying change of purity, like the uh, excrement is being burnt, then the smoke of it, okay, it is, oh, it is not, it is pure. And the same thing when the wine is in, is, uh, for example, takes a long time, it will return back to wine as well and it will be a grape juice. Clothes here, if you know the spot of impurity, then remove it if possible and wash the place of water. If you do not know the spot of impurity, then wash the whole garment. If the impurity in menses or post-childbirth bleeding, then refer back to point number four. Right. I know you've got lots of questions here. We'll leave the questions in a minute. Inshallah, I'll give you plenty of time for questions. Okay, I want to finish just... Uh, the three of the three titles before we go to the benefits, inshallah, next week. So please, can you just read a bit fast for the purification of the fat, for the butter. Purifying clarified butter and other similar substances. Ibn Abbas relates from Maymuna that the Prophet ﷺ was asked about a mouse that fell into a pot of clarified butter. He said, take the mouse and what is, what is around it and throw it away, then eat the rest of your clarified butter. Bukhari, Bukhari 235. Okay, we said there is no difference between the solid and between the liquid. No difference. If 
the mouse f f f f fell into that uh, clarified butter, if it's, uh, for example, solid, we remove the dead rat and we remove what is around it. If it is liquid, then we as well do the same thing. If the clarified butter hasn't changed in order or color or taste, then it is okay. Otherwise, you have to leave the whole thing. Right, just go to the next title, please. Purifying the skin of a dead animal. Tanning purifies the skin and fur of a dead animal. This is based on the hadith of Ibn Abbas, in which the Prophet ﷺ said, if the animal skin is tanned, it is purified. Bukhari and Muslim. Okay, that's, it's only on Muslim. Not in Bukhari, in Muslim. 363. 363. This hadith is only in Muslim. 363. Naam. Purifying mirrors and similar objects. Similar objects. What are similar objects? The mirrors? Sword. Washing line. All these which has got no pores. Okay, plate. Yes. Mirrors, knives, swords, nails, bones, glass, painted pots and other smooth surfaces that have no pores are purified by simply wiping them and removing any impure remains. The companions of the Prophet ﷺ used to pray while wearing swords smeared with blood and they used to just wipe the swords to purify them. Here, <laughs> the blood, is that pure or impure? That owns on the sword. Pure, because he's just here, well, he is at the moment saying, because based upon what he said before, that the blood is impure. But we have established only what? The menses, blood and post-childbirth bleeding. Now, Purifying shoes. Shoes may be purified by rubbing them against the ground, as long as the remains of the impurity are removed. Abu Huraira narrated that the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, if one of you stepped in some filth, the dirt will purify his shoes. Related by Abu Dawood. 385. 385. In another narration, it states, if one of you steps in some filth with his shoes on, the dirt will purify them. Abu Sa'id reported that the Prophet ﷺ saying, when a person comes to the mosque, he should look at his shoes. If he finds any filth on them, he should wipe them against the ground and pray in them. Abu Dawood 650. Abu Dawood 650. Right. Remember the incident when the Messenger of Allah went inside the mosque and suddenly while he was praying, he took his shoes off and he put them on his left. The companions were looking, they did the same thing. The Messenger of Allah said, after he finished the prayer, after he turned, he just saw all the companions putting their shoes on the left. They asked him, why did you do that? Because we saw your Messenger doing it and so we did it. They followed the Messenger and everything. So they said, he said to them, well, Jibreel salam came and told me while he was praying that my shoes had filth. So I had to take them off. So, verily, if somebody or one of you comes to the mosque, then let him look at his shoes. If it is impure with filth, then let it, let him what? Rub it against the ground. Can you use water to go and clean your shoes? Yes. But this is to just to, to speed up the action of purification. I mean, not everybody is going to have go to go into the bathroom and cleaning his shoes. And of course, that is if you pray in a mosque where the shoes is allowed. But if you pray in a carpet like this, and people are going to really fussy about it, then... Don't do it and they pray with your bare feet, Allah Ta'ala. Now, any other qu any questions before? Shall we leave this here until next week? So next week, inshallah, we'll be talking about useful points that are greatly needed. I've got so here, having made a copy, inshallah, I'll make a copy next week. This is, I'm going to be giving you eight and nine, page eight and nine, inshallah. Those are useful points in purifications and fiqh principles as well. So that's inshallah for next week. Sorry? What's seven and eight? Eight, seven. Yeah, seven and eight. I said seven and eight. Uh, did I? I'm sorry. Seven and eight and nine and ten and eleven. All right. Any questions, brothers? I thought there would be a lot of questions regarding these issues. You know, how to clean impurities. Now. Excellent. Good question. He's asking about you praying behind an Imam which is he's a Hanafi. Right. Whether he's a Hanafi or Shafi'i or whatever, you know, for example, the Shafi'i, they do uh, raise up the hands for Qunut in Salat al Fajr. In every Fajr, they have to do that because if they don't do it, they have to make Sujud Sahu. In the second Raka'ah of Salat al-Fajr, they have to put their hands up 
for making dua khunut al fajr the shafi's uh, first of all we have to really respect every sheikh's opinion now we could imagine that that imam is abu hanifa himself okay he abu hanifa himself and he's praying and he believes for example that the uh, question was asking about which you want to talk about yeah badr rafael din which word? Yeah, okay yes i mean say that mean if for example he doesn't say the amin because it is hasn't been made clear to him through proofs that it there's no amin there to be allowed then we should respect him so we could imagine abu hanifa is there but if you that you that imam in particular that you know him for example he's not following abu hanifa because of knowledge he's not really discussing the, 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 the proofs of abu hanifa he's a person who's just blindly following abu hanifa to the extent that he believes Isa alayhi salam when he comes down he's going to rule by the Abu Hanifa's methodology to that extent then you shouldn't really follow him but you could imagine Abu Hanifa is in front of you so you pray yes you're respectful Shafi you're respectful you raise up your hands in the qunut even if it's a bid'ah it's a bid'ah you raise up your hands because you know if you don't know the imam then you should do like the imam if you know the imam and you know that he's been you've been approaching him you've been advising him and so on and so forth and he still then you don't have to follow the imam and i would really urge you if there's a you know a nearby mosque or something like this which is not a hanafi somebody else and you follow that imam is better okay okay but not most of the imams are like not all the imams are the same most of the imams are hanafi but not all the imams are the same first of all so if you yeah even if you know the hanafi masjid if you don't know the imam follow him Okay, if you know the Imam, follow him. It's better to follow the Imam, Allah Ta'ala. We don't want to cause more difference among the scholars and amongst the people. This is how we unity. You see, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud prayed for Raqqa when he said the Messenger of Allah and Abu Bakr and Umar, they prayed only two. And this is something to do with uh, 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 an obligation. An obligation. It's a mandatory. It is in the religion that if you are doing Ihram, you are in Mina, you pray what? To Raqqa. But he prayed behind him and he prayed for. He didn't pray two and then just paid salutation and then left the imam. He prayed for. And he said, verily, causing divergence amongst the hearts of the people is worse and more evil. Okay? And that is why Azati Sheikh Ibn Baz and Sheikh Al-Albani sets a very good example. Sheikh Al-Albani says putting the hand on the right and the left after the ruku' is a bid'ah. But at the same time, he puts the right on the left when he prays behind Sheikh Ibn Baz. I put the right on the left when I pray behind Sheikh Al-Baz. I put the right on the left when I pray behind Sheikh's this. I put the right behind left and right behind Sheikh because I know that they put the right on the left. Uh, but in the haram, this is a well different case because you see in the haram you find not just people praying left and right, people praying with nothing. They don't, they're just putting their hands maybe in their heads or, you know, so when you do like this or you do like this, it doesn't make a difference. A lot of people there. We're talking about a masjid like this, yeah, mashallah, where we know that people, all of them doing like this after Ruku' and this person on his own doing like that. Why? Why do you single yourself out? Before I go to the second question, I just uh, looked at the brother there. He reminded me of a question he asked me last week. I want to clarify that question after I made a very, very thorough research into that question, which is regarding the alcohol. Right, as I said, <clears throat> the alcohol itself, we have a difference amongst the scholars regarding using the alcohol in medicine whether it's external or to drink it, or using the alcohol in the perfume, and of course using it as well for washing up liquids and so on and so forth. Say for example, you have a chocolate, it's got a percentage of alcohol. Remember the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, which is the authentic hadith. Whatever, too much of it makes you drunk, then the little of it is what? Haram. Let me give you an example. Have you got a cup here? Okay, imagine you've got a cup here. All right, this is. Right. We have here a cup of water. Okay. We brought half a cup of alcohol. Okay. And I'm putting the half a cup of alcohol into that water. Before I do that, this is what? Haram or halal? Haram. To drink, to use, haram. I put it there. 
Alright? Now, that drink, we want to verify if it's halal or haram. If, for example, I drink that cup, and similar cup with the same percentage, and a similar cup with the same percentage, let's say about 50 cups, and I get drunk, then that one is what? Haram. But, if I put 5 milligrams, 5 milligrams of alcohol, into that cup of water, the 5 milligrams, haram or halal? Haram. I put in the cup, 5 milligrams, and we have a full cup here. I drink 100 cups of that. Would I get drunk? So the little of that what? That one, the original cup is what? Halal or haram? Halal. Do you understand that now? But the process of you putting that, this is something that shouldn't be done by you, as a Muslim. You shouldn't be really having alcohol into your place where you mix up. That's what we, told, we tell the pharmacists. You can't, for example, make the medicine yourself. You could buy it and purchase it, no problem, because you're purchasing something which is already is a halal. Because we said that that cup with the 5 milligrams is what? Halal. But that 5 milligrams on its own is what? So that thing, 5 milligrams, I can't buy it, I can't carry it, I can't purchase it, I can't sell it, I can't transfer it, I can't juice it out. 10 things are being cursed with al khamr 10 things are being cursed with al khamr with the alcohol. Alcohol is the mother. Is the mother of alcohol. Somebody will tell you uh, one day that a uh, pharmacist came and he said, by the way, this ethanol is really the one makes you drunk and there's another material in it. It's called ethanol. You know, anyway, I said, what is, what is the end, the bottom line of this? He said, there are two substances in the alcohol. One which is toxicate the person, makes him drunk, and the other one is poison, kills him. So, the one that really kills, is that halal to have? <laughs> Right. Okay. That one, we said, whatever, too much of it. It's a haram one, which is the one that if you mix, we said whatever, too much of it, is, uh, it makes you drunk, then the less of it is, 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 is haram. Now, the, the one would kill, we would say, Prophet Sallallahu he said, La barara wa la barara. If something is going to really harm you, then it's haram. So it's haram from a different angle here. That portion of alcohol. So let's go now to the, for example, the medicine. Man, somebody is using medicine to drink now. And it's got percentage of alcohol. We say if that percentage is enough, if you drink about six, seven bottles, let's say, makes you drunk, and then that bottle itself is what? Haram. But if you drink hundred bottles of it, still, does it make you drunk? Then that bottle is what? But for you to make it as a Muslim? Haram. See what I mean? MashaAllah. If you understand that principle, you'll be relaxed. You're using it for perfume. Now, using it for perfume, you're not drinking it. You are using it for what? Use. Now, Sheikh Mashur, as I said to you, Sheikh Mashur ibn Hassan al-Salman, he says, for external use, it doesn't matter, he says. It doesn't matter, because it is not impure. Remember when we talked about alcohol, we said it is pure. It is impurity, what? It is when you drink it. But to use it outside is no problem. Sheikh al he said, still, still, even if you use it for perfume, if that perfume, you have to drink it yourself. Never mind, it's going to kill you, but we're talking about now intoxication. Okay. If you have to drink it, drink about three, four bottles of it, makes you drunk, and that alcohol is haram. Sheikh Rashur says, no, this is for external use, so the, it is not najis to use it for outside, so alcohol there doesn't matter, it's 100% or 50% or 2%. Do you understand that now? As well for the soap and so on and so forth. Now, does that solve your question now? You're happy? And then, what are you going to use? Perfume or <laughs> Every time there is a question and answer, remember, the answer can be falls into two categories. Taqwa and fatwa. Before I give the fatwa, I can give the taqwa. If somebody is going to use perfume, which is 100% alcohol, get, getting people dizzy with it, the smell in, it's no good. Even if it's halal. Do you understand me? Taqwa and fatwa. Now. The problem comes with, you know, like, um, some people understand this, but once people have told me that a brother from this nation told him that it's all right to drink alcohol, Right. Okay. We just explained it now. To drink that little five milligrams is haram or halal? Haram. Because too much of that five milligrams is going to put you off. But if you mix that in a bucket of water, if you drink hundreds of buckets of that water, it's okay. So that bucket, the original bucket is what? Halal. Now to make that bucket is haram. And pharmacist, a Muslim one, should never have alcohol in with him to mix and make this medicine. To purchase it and sell it, no problem. But to do it because he's going to have the five milligrams there. Five milligrams is haram. Ten 
people are cursed with it. How many people? Let's count it. Who's cursed with the alcohol? Alcohol itself is cursed. That's number one. Wabai'u. What is Wabai'u? That is the one who sells it. Wamubta'u. The one who was purchased it. That's number two. How many? Got three. Okay. And after that, the one who carries it. And the one who's been carried to. The one who juices it out. And the one who brings the stuff to be juiced out. How many? We've got seven. We've got eight and nine. What else? The one who pours it. And the one who is, yes. The, so they will pause it. And the ones who is being poured to. Yes. Yes. Sharibuha. Nine. Also that's the last one now. Huh? Sit to the table. Get to the... What else? No, well, you shouldn't really sit down, but it's not... Uh, no. Okay. This is your homework. Find the hadith. This is Sunnah Nabi Dawood. Find the hadith and find me the last one. We have mentioned nine now. We've got the last one left. We have discussed this before, so we're not going to go through it. Gelatine itself, we said, keep away from it. As for Renette, Renette, no problem. Gelatine, is haram. Naam. No, hang on a second. You're talking about the five percent, the five milligrams. You're not talking about the mixture. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, but the thing is, it is not the Muslim who does it sometimes. It's, you know, the kuffar, they do it as well. So when you buy that, when you buy that pen, which is a mixture, it's halal. All right? Yeah. Mm. Mm. You shouldn't. This is haram, cursed. All right? No, 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 that's not intention. As well, action here. <laughs> Tension plus action. So you can't mix it. You can't have that in your shop. Because we said, turn, curse it. You, when you're pouring it, it's, it's, you've been cursed now. <laughs> and even if you're pouring it, because you're using the five milligrams. The five milligrams is the haram. As for that drink, the result is halal. Okay. Now, for example, somebody buying from you grapes. He said, I want to buy grapes to really turn it into wine. Would you sell it? You see what I mean? The grapes itself, you could sell it halal. But I am having the intention now to make it something haram. No, I can't. Because I will be cursed. And then when they're going to be giving him the thing to be juiced out. To make it alcohol, wallahu ta'ala. Right. Now. By the way, I have heard as well. You know the mint. The mint, sorry, the mint. Mint, you put in the tea. The mint. You could really uh, use it instead of alcohol for the medicine. If the uh, doctors, Muslim ones, can use that, I would be really good, you know, grateful and helpful, alhamdulillah. The mint itself, okay, as used instead of alcohol in the medicine, that would be the best. And he's using, he's keeping it for a longer period. Why? What's the reason? Well, now you buy so many things, so many 
Okay. That is why the hadith is being very clear. That is why ten are cursed with alcohol. Keeping it and using it and pouring it, it shouldn't be done by a Muslim. Alcohol itself is the mother of toxication. It's the mother of khamra, we say. Alcohol itself, ethanol. is the khamra itself. Who shouldn't use it? Why? I'm just asking you, and that's why I ask you, why should he do that? Okay? I don't want to escalate the matter now. You know, oh yeah, question like this. Please. What I'm saying here, the alcohol, the five milligrams, shouldn't be used by somebody who is a Muslim to mix this medicine to make it. So the medicine itself is halal. If the percentage is too much, if you drink too much of it, it makes you drunk, then that medicine is haram. It's like the five milligrams of the alcohol. All right? No. Okay. Excellent. Who would drink perfume? If you are laughing about this, but I have seen people drinking perfume. If you go to Saudi Arabia, unfortunately, where they don't have alcohol there, I have seen so many people purchasing special perfume, which is about 85%. So they use it like uh, cologne or, I don't know, for, uh, aftershave, you know, aftershave thing. I have seen them. And what they do, they wrap it with a piece of paper. And I was asking the, you know, the person there, why do you wrap it? So he's, he's a taxi driver, he's using it for alcohol, he's drinking. It's a killer. Because it's almost 100% alcohol, you know? So yeah, those people, they do it. Yes. We'll give you child before. Any question regarding this? Yes. Is he deliberately doing this? No. <laughs> right. Inshallah, when you get this page, if you talk about those, which is the useful point here, okay, it will solve every problem that you are thinking of. Because I, every time I teach, I go, and I put some the notes here. Actually, for a person who found out later on after this prayer that there's a lot of, for example, extremists in his clothes. Well, he made his ninja, but the clothes itself had extremist. No problem. Yes. If the point is intentionally doing it, then it will invalidate. Now. What's the question related to that person? If you went to work, you know you can't come back to the public service. Go to the toilet, put your urine on you. can't pray because you have your clothes. Mm. Come home, hmm. uh, the cloth itself, you can't really pour any water there, even if at work. Don't make it tight. No, no, you, but, but, I mean, you, the, it was certainly the urine. You don't have to really water. You just put water there. You know, you put water. You put water in the underwear, and that's it. It will be, become clean. You don't have to take it off and go and wash it and take it. Put water there. You just bring water and, you know. So put, what you, put in water wherever you think the urine is. If you don't, if you don't know where it is, gone on your back, then you, then you wash the whole dishwasher. Okay? Yeah. Make the yamun. Well, we don't tell you to really miss the prayer. If you can't, then you become under the Ahlul Adar. Then, no, then say make the yamun, sorry. Then you make wudu and you pray. No problem about that. Alright? You Ahlul Adar. So for example, we say to you here, because you can't do it, for example, somebody, let's say, sow some excrement. And he couldn't remove it. Okay? He sowed it and he couldn't remove it. Still, his prayer is valid. Now. Yes. Right. Excellent. Now the question is, is regarding praying 11 raka'ah and 12, 20 raka'ah behind the imam in the tarawih prayer. Because we established there that the person has to follow the imam in the prayer. Now, the following of the imam in the prayer is inside the prayer, not outside the prayer. So once he's finished, he's got no authority to lead me now. Okay? It's like you're traveling with people. He's the leader. Okay, the leader, that means in the journey. As long as I am in the journey with him, he could really be my Amir telling me to do this and to do that. But after the traveling, he can't order me and can't give me any orders. So after the Imam is finished, 
then I've got now to go to back to my what I believe is a sunnah. Okay? That's answer the questions. So I would say it's 11 bakr. Right. You know, you know, if Sheikh Abani said that it's a bidah, is it haram to do a bit if you think and you know something is a bidah? Okay. Something is a bid'ah is different from somebody who is a mubtadi'ah. A bid'ah, maybe people will do bid'ah without them knowing about it, or they know about it because they believe there's a proof for it. But a mubtadi'ah who he knows that there is no proof of what he's doing, and he's still insisting to do it. That's a mubtadi'ah, and he calls for his bid'ah, calls people to do it. That's the difference. So, Sheikh Ibn Baz, we believe he's not a mubtadi'ah, of course. And he's a person, he's doing something, of course, because he's following a proof. And I said, to him, there's a proof there. Which is why Ibn Fajr he said that the Messenger وسلم, whenever he stands up in the prayer, he puts the right on the left. Shaykh al Bani said, oh, well, this is a general hadith. We are applying it to something which is specific. That is, the standing up after the ruku. We know that there are so many companions narrated the Messenger وسلم's prayer. None of them said that he would put the right on the left after the ruku. And that is why when we apply general hadith on specific actions in the prayer, that would be regarded as a bid'ah. See what I mean? That's how the sort of difference of opinion rate amongst the two. Wallahu ta'ala. Yes. We're going to ask you a question in it, inshallah. Yes, it's as long as in the class. Yeah, no problem. Slaughter an animal. Hmm. To starve it? Why? Oh, no, no, no. You slaughter it even if it's full. You know, give him water, give him food, you can slaughter it. There's no uh, sort of uh, uh, Islamic etiquette here. You have to be followed. When you slaughter an animal, you have to really, for example, feed him or not, or not feed him or make him faster. Ah, maybe the jalala you're talking about? The jalala. The jalala is something that has been eating filth all the time. We said that it's forbidden to ride it, forbidden to take and drink the milk of it. We're forbidden as well to eat the meat of it. We said that we lock it up, we make it eat good food. We don't make it fast to die, we make it good food and then we use it, inshallah. Yes, brother. Kept you a long time. <laughs> oh dear. I like that. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. Hang on. First question, we have answered this before, and we just answered it again and again, that is the shoes, putting the shoes on. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he all the time, whenever he wants to, as well, to uh, show the personality of a Muslim person, he would like him to be different from the Jews and the Christians. Grow up the beard, be different from the majors and the Christians and the Jews. And then, for example, in the Memphis, the woman is being kept in the house, while the Jews, they kick her out of the, out of the house. Jews have been saying all the time, why is it Muhammad? Everything in our religion, he would oppose it. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he heard from the companion that the Jews, they fast Ashura. It's a day that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why? He saved Musa and his tribes from the pharaohs. So he said, Messenger of Allah, so he said, we are, we got the more priority to have respect to Musa alayhi salam, so we will fast it. Next year, companions came, messenger of Allah. You know, we are really similar to Jews now. We fast on the same day. Okay, when I, inshallah, next year if I live, I'm going to fast the ninth with it. To be different from the Jews. But he did not live to that year. Same thing here with the, putting the shoes. He said, put your shoes on and be different from the Jews and play with it. Sallu fi ni'alikum wa khalikul yahud. Pray in your shoes and be different from the Jews. Why the Jews? Because... You know that Musa alayhi salam, when he spoke to Allah near the sacred valley, فَخْلَعْنَ عَلَيْكَ إِنَّكَ بِالْوَادِ الْمُقَدَّسِ Alright? So that is why we pray in our shoes. Now, is he, is that, does the Messenger of Allah pray with bare feet? Yes, he prays with bare feet as well. So it depends. If your mosque is made of pebbles, you know, stones, and things like this, no harm to come with the shoes. If it's made of carpet and everybody, alhamdulillah, comes with shoes, no problem, no problem about that. We tell you that please clean your shoes and come with your shoes on. But if everybody's playing on the carpet with their bare feet and you come in with your shoes causing a problem and fitna, remember the hadith of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. You know, that would lead to more evil. We don't have evil here. We don't want people smashing each other with their shoes and having punches because of this. And nah. Second question. Before that, can have a break there. Question. Salam.
Yes. Yes, you, you either pour water or it is better to remove the sand and put water there. If it's dry, no problem. Yes. That is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made five things for the Prophet sallallahu One of them that the land is made as a masjid for him. Wherever he goes, he could pray. You know, the masjid of our masjid can be a tent. Can a synagogue be a tent? Can a church be a tent? No. Synagogue and the churches has to be special, with drawing. Our mosque can be a tent. Yes, alhamdulillah. Yes, Prophet. Is he a friend that he stopped praying or somebody else? Well, we have to as well now, because he's your friend, you have to really now uh, advise him and admonish him properly. Because if he doesn't really uh, follow what you're saying and he insists not, on not on praying, you should really do something about abandoning him, you know. Because he, the person doing like this, then he's jeopardizing his whole religion now. Why? Because, you see, even if there is no day at all, let's say you are living in the Antarctica, six months day, six months night, what does that mean? You stay for six months and six months, that means you don't pray at all. So you go to the Antarctica, there, there is no twilight, there is no daylight. Six month night and then six month days. So what do you do? At the Dajjal, when he comes, he comes for 40, okay, 40 years. Now those, 40 days, sorry. One day is like a year. And one day is like a month. And one day is like a week. Now the companions, because they got fiqh, messenger of Allah, what do we do about the prayer if the whole day is like a year? You know, we're going to have 36, 5, 60, 36, 365 days as in one day. The sun is going to be extending for that long. What do we do? What do we do? Do we do just one prayer for the whole 36? <laughs> he said, no. فَقْدُرُ لَهُ قَدْرَةً What do you do? You, 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 you imagine that there is, a, you know, five daily prayers. So, ظهر between ظهر and عصر, two hours, three hours. That's how you do it. The sun is going to be there. But that's how you do it. The same thing we apply it in the Antarctica or in the North Pole. We tell these people going to the North Pole, please don't go to the North Pole. <laughs> okay, so tell him to pray. As for the twilight, regarding the twilight, the twilight zone, lots of people here, lots of Islamic centers, they base their Isha. He's talking about the Isha. Listen, you know, on the white twilights. On the white twilight. If you go to uh, those people who are specialists in astronomy and ask them about the twilight, they will ask you which twilight are you talking about? Red? White? Which one? There is more than twilight. The Salafi twilight, which is the Sunnah one, it is not the white, it is the red. And the red twilight, it will disappear in this country. Whether it is in the mid of July or the mid of August, it will disappear. We have, you know, this phenomena repeats itself twice. Uh, I think it's uh, May, somehow in May, somehow May in June, that there will be no twilight, that, like, there will be like a light. But the red twilight will disappear. See what I mean? So they, then we set ourselves from the red twilight. So for those people, for example, delaying their maghrib so much, for example, they're having maghrib 9 o'clock. And what is the time? Is it? Half past 12. Between 9 o'clock and half past 3 hours, 3 and a half hours. The red twilight has already disappeared. Remember, it's only about an hour, an hour and a half between maximum, between Maghrib and Isha. Not more than two hours. An hour and a half, two hours. Not three and a half hours. So remember, it's the red twilight for Allah Ta'ala. I would like to have some sort of a committee here, which is for the Sunnah Salafi people, to really make now the timing of the Isha. Like we do it, Alhamdulillah, in High Wickham at the moment. We really don't. We're doing our own timing. We're not, doing, we're not following any of these being timetables being set by the Regent Park or where they depend on the Hanafi twilight, which is the white one. 
We depend on the disappearance of the red twilight. Now. He has to pay back and compensate for all these prayers that he hasn't paid. If he's going to listen, inshallah. If he doesn't, bring him to me. <laughs> now. What time do you breathe at the moment? Uh, the Isha, uh, roughly, it maximum, it doesn't really exceed, it doesn't exceed 11 o'clock. It's less than 11. Even we are on a high altitude, in high Wickham. Do you understand the high altitude? That means we could see the sun, you know, really there, deep. High altitude. So yeah, the, our, for example, our Maghrib is longer. Because once it's been, it disappeared here, still we could see it. It doesn't disappear in our area. It's about five minutes after your Maghrib. No. All right. Combination of the Maghrib and the Isha. It's a big issue. Okay, it's a big issue. The Manchester, they do it for three months. I know that. Uh, they do it, not in all the mosques. They do, they do it in uh, Didsbury Mosque. I know that. Yeah, yeah, I know that. Muhammad said he was my sheikh. He was. <laughs> uh, they do it there. It's the three months. I wouldn't say that it is. I'm not going to say it is invalid prayer. Everybody has to do them. The all these prayers that he's been done. But I would say, if they depended upon the white, the red twilight, they will never have to come to this, you know, combination. Because in their in their timetable, Isha, I remember during July, it comes 12:51. Fajr quarter past one. Masha Allah. How many between Isha and Fajr? You have only exactly half an hour. No, no, 25 minutes. So you imagine you're praying Taraweeh at that time. Which we did. We did. We were that time. Taraweeh. So you're going to have your sandwiches with you as well. Two rak'at. That's right. <laughs> yeah, okay. Because you're going to pray after Isha. Now, but actually, they pray the Taraweeh after the combination. They didn't pray. They didn't wait until 12.51. It's impossible. You can't pray 12, 11 rak'at, you know, within 25 minutes. And plus, you're going to have this sahur. No way. <laughs> now, it's timetable. It's, it's not correct. I don't really follow it. Like timetable in Manchester. There's another timetable for the Ahl Sunnah Mosque. So uh, I would say combination of the prayer. I can't say it is, but it's not from the Sunnah to do it like this. It is not. For three months to do combination like this. No. Because of the hadith. There's a hadith which says about the white. And the hadith, the authentic one is the red. Shafaq al Ahmad. Authentic is Shafaq al Ahmad. That's why. Yes, it's life. Actually, when we said that to Sheikh uh, Al Halabi, uh, we're doing it, it's MashaAllah. Even in Jordan, they don't do it. Because they have to follow the government. It's only, so he said, well, try to introduce this to the, to the other, inshallah, Salafi centers and Sunnah centers. We're trying to do that, inshallah. <laughs> you want to find it? Inshallah, we'll teach them the book. If you want to have a book, your new book, okay, in that book. Where you go to Salat al Maghrib. I'm going to show you now in a minute, inshallah. If you open. In English, I'm not good at it. Don't look in the Arabic at first. I'll tell you in English. Right. Okay. It is. Right. After. Before the Adhan, okay, which page in English? Let me just, I've got it in Arabic, can go. Uh, page 75? Are you sure? After 75? Don't think so. Are you sure? Yeah? Okay. Yes? Okay, you got the Maghrib prayer? Okay, the Maghrib prayer. Okay, can you just read the Maghrib prayer? Sir? Read it. Can you read it? Yeah, brother. In English. Yes? Yeah. Yes? The time for the sunset prayer, Maghrib. 
The time for the sunset prayer begins with the disappearance of the sun and lasts until the red twilight ends. Finished. Allah, so I'm not going to go through that. <laughs> it's a long subject. All right? Yes. Now, actually, alhamdulillah, I don't think there's a lot of difference regarding the dhuhr. Because the dhuhr technique to really spot what is the dhuhr time is one. And the asr is the same thing. But the jama'ah. And as well, there's a difference between the Hanafis and regarding when is the Asr starts. When it starts. Okay, the Asr prayer. But the Dhuhr is, because there's a consensus upon this. You have the difference of just timing because of one city is different from another city and far away. Different timing, that's all. As for the Asr, because the Hanafi believe that the Asr starts when the shadow of something becomes twice the length of it. While we believe that the Asr starts when the time when the shadow of something is equal to the object plus the meridian, the meridian shadow. I have to really explain that when I bring computer inshallah. When we come to those things, I'll explain it. Okay? Uh, we have something that's called mizwala in Arabic to determine the dhuhr and the asr, mizwala. As for the maghrib, it's the sunset. As for the isha, it's the disappearance of the red twilight. As for the fajr, it's the appearance of the white streak of light above the horizon. The mizwala is something like a block of, a piece of block of uh, wood with a nail on it and there's circles, okay, just to, just to measure the shadow of the, that nail. We say, for example, that at the beginning, you'll find the sun, when it rises, the shadow is at, it's, uh, at its maximum, isn't it? Because the sun is rising from this way. So the shadow is really long. So the sun comes now to the what? Close to the middle of the sky, that is close to the dhuhr. So it's going to get, the shadow is going to get what? Less and less and less. Until it becomes to the, its minimum. When it becomes to its minimum there, it stays there for a, maybe a t- 10 to 12 minutes. And this is what we call the zawal. The zawal where you're not supposed to pray, those 12 minutes. Where the sun as well changes its direction, but the length of the shadow stays the same. Say for example, that the shadow at the beginning, it was, say, one meter. Became, decreased, decreased, until it became 20 centimeters. And then after 12 minutes, became 21. That means 20 is the minimum. This is the meridian shadow. So, once it becomes 21, this is the whole started. Alright? This is the whole started. Now, the shadow is going to increase, or it's going to be decreasing? It's going to increase from the other side. Once the shadow becomes the length of the nail, let's say the length of the nail is what? Say for example, 30 centimeters. Plus the meridian shadow. What is the meridian shadow in this example? 20. 30 plus 20, 50. Once it becomes 50 centimeters plus, that is the start of the what? The asa. For the chef the Hanafi, they say no. It is not. This plus this plus the nail twice. That means 30 plus 30, 60 the nail twice plus the meridian which is 20, that's 80 centimeters. And that's why they play almost what? When the sun is going to be yellow. Nah. If there is no uh, alternative, and the, you're not praying when the sun is yellow, still a bit white, yeah, pray with the Jamal. Nah. Nah. And the timing, yes. You break it because of the timing. So you are in Ramadan, where in Luton here, and the other places where? Wow. Same area. Unbelievable. No, 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 no. The twilight has nothing to do with it. It's a sunset. Breaking the fast is not with the twilight. The breaking of the fast is for the sun. So once the sun disappears, that's when the shadow is. I mean, the Maghrib should be, you know, universal. It should be the same as in one city. I have no idea. Ask this, ask this. Ah, if they want to make sure, you should not. The sunnah is to break as soon as the sun sets. If those people delay it, like the, you know, the Shia, they delay it until they see the stars. They don't break the fast for us. Play until the really dark. Then we shouldn't do that. This is a bid'ah. 
تعجل في طرح ما لن تؤخر في طرح يعني يعني يابد all the time should break the fast as soon as the sun gets down نعم بل Right. If, for example, they're not praying at the right time, you're giving me an example which is different here. Like, for example, let's say a person in the Imam is praying the Dhuhr, and the Dhuhr starts half past 12, he's starting at quarter past 12. We should never pray with him. We should never pray with him because he's praying before the time. But if you're talking about the example where the Imam, through his own knowledge, decided, because he said, well-known Sheikh there, who's done the combination in that prayer, And he believes it is authentic and correct. And you should go along with it. Because, I mean, you're not going to pray at Maghrib and Isha all the time on your own, okay? So I'm saying it is because he's got a dalil and proof for that. Now, this combination is different. Combination here, we say, is it legitimate, legitimate to make a combination? Is it legitimate to make a combination? If it is, no, no problem. If, for example, you're, you're in the rain and the snow, If the Imam sees it's difficult for the people to attend the Asr prayer, so you could really make Dhuhr and Asr together, Maghrib and Isha together. The Jumu'ah extends, not the Dhuhr, Jumu'ah is different. Jumu'ah starts before Dhuhr. Okay, the Jumu'ah people can start before Dhuhr. Okay, it's actually... Scholars say, start from Duha, straight up to sunrise. This is the Jumu'ah, all of it Jumu'ah. Extends and doesn't matter until Asr. No problem, because it's Jumu'ah, it's different. And that is why, when we have Eid and Jumu'ah together, it suffices the person, if he goes to the Eid prayer, not to come to the Jumu'ah. Yes. No. No, 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 it's not really, he said, the messenger of Allah, another narration, he said, remove the sand there and put water. But as long, you see, the, the, the whole issue here is as long as you get it clean. If you don't put, if you don't, even if you don't put water at all, it will get clean by itself. This is to speed up the action, do you understand that? Wallahu ta'ala, subhanakallah, bihamdi. Ashhadu an la ilaha inta astaghfiru. Come here privately, then I'll ask a question, inshallah.